No way. I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps. It's there. The 284 of Green Street. It's there! I can't believe it. We were a very close family. We were good children. We had no knowledge of the history of the cockpit. Nobody, there's someone in here. Andy, Andy now, help me. I know what happened and I know it was true. Well, perhaps you've got something to say, sir. I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Yannick's vocal cords to pieces. If I stop for half a minute, I get a sore throat. Who's chasing you? I think if I had to pass again, it would kill me. We are in Enfield, and here in the 1970s at the U84 on Green Street happens what is claimed to be the most famous and best documented poltergeist possession phenomenon in history. family consisting of a mother and four children, Janet, Margaret, Johnny and Bing. A house where something truly shocking happens that during the 1970s will completely change the history of spiritualism. Here behind me is the house and believe me, I have chills telling you what happened, and most of all I'm scared because you can't be here at all. In Enfield's house has been covered in numerous films, and also in The Counter Conjuring, which you know how much I love. But this time, we are going to go deeper. We're going to look at all the elements of what happened in the late 1970s in Enfield, England. Here, the Hodgson family moved, a mother with four children. Theirs is a very normal family, but the house where they go to live has absolutely nothing normal about it. It is the evening of August 30, 1977. Little Janet, only 11 years old, has difficulty sleeping. She tells her mother, named Peggy, that she hears something jumping in her bed. Of course, her mother Peggy does not give much thought to what an 11-year-old girl says and invites her to just sleep. But, the next day, August 31st, the difficulties in falling asleep continue. Johnny and Janet call their mother Peggy in the middle of the night, who arrives in the room and there is nothing there. The children continue to cry, however. They say there is someone in the room. They hear noises, creaking noises. They hear their bed moving. She invites the children to stop whining and again sends them to bed. He turns off the light and at that moment something incredible manifests itself inside that room. An incredible door that moves the very heavy oak chest of drawers in a blow. At that point, violent banging in the walls also begins. Something that will be described by the Hudson family as rap, that is, continuous banging repeated one after another. Yes. It's a blow. For no now. Yes, it's true, you understand. Now she likes to upset this family. Yes, it's so good. Now, please go away. Because I think you've had enough of his jokes, you won't go away. But I would like you to leave and go away because I think you have upset this family long enough and it's time for you to go away. You understand me? Please go away. Just go away. It is absolutely necessary that you go away. No, you must not yes, be stubborn. Sir. You must go away. Well, he has to. I'm sorry, but he has to stop bothering this. 
Peggy is upset, she is scared and doesn't know what is going on, and the first thing she comes to do is leave the house. She takes her children out of the house and goes to the neighbors for help, who, in disbelief, enter the house. Husband and wife are convinced that there are thieves in there, because there is no other explanation how a cupboard could ever move. Those neighbors, however, find nothing, and Peggy, exasperated, decides to call law enforcement. Law enforcement will find nothing during that evening, but one of them will testify that he saw with his own eyes a set move. Over the next few days, Peggy Hudson decides to bring in reporters, onlookers, and anyone who can solve that problem. She is convinced that there is a poltergeist inside her house. Commonly, a poltergeist is defined as a presence that disturbs the quiet of a dwelling, creating confusion within that home, moving chairs, tables, disturbing sleep, and frightening the owners of that home. Peggy, however, does not give up and also asks for help from the Society for Psychological Research, the SP a real society that deals with paranormal research and intervening on behalf of the SPR is Amoris Gross, who for six months documents a real crescendo of horror around the family. Here he gets to witness the levitation of marbles, levo, toys, and even the levitation of the Oxon family's own little girls. And the thing that Re wrote being most disturbing was that whenever he saw something floating in midair, when he then picked it up, that object was boiling hot, as if an energy had left its heat on that object. And on September 12, Gross is joined by another member of the PSR. His name is Guy Playfair, and the two begin to investigate what was going on inside the Oxen house. Their search that night is directed to a noise, a continuous rap as it was called by the Oxon family. A noise, however, that was distributed around the house in no logical order. It could come from the floor and then suddenly from the ceiling. One of the most disturbing phenomena they witness is one that occurred one evening, where at some point they begin to hear one of the girls screaming, Help! It's taking my leg! They enter the house and in fact find Margaret, Janet's older sister, in tears standing in an abnormal position on the stairs. Both men try to grab the child to save her or otherwise help her, but she is adamant. It is as if there is an outside force that will not allow her to be... Somebody help me! Moved. It is December, 1,977,000. The poltergeist phenomena are exaggerating more and more. It is at this time when Janet begins to receive on her body the violence of this poltergeist. She is jostled in her sleep, made to levitate, and it is all witnessed in these photographs. Shots that have gone around the world and have disturbed generations of people. And I too, every time I see these pictures I get chills. There is a part of me that doesn't want to believe it, and a part of me that wants to believe it. This is all too strange. Is it a little girl jumping and being photographed jumping, or is it a little girl being levitated by a dark force? We will probably never have the answer. We do have other information, however, and we have it thanks to Maurice Gross, who continues to invigenate on this case and more specifically wants to challenge the poltergeist to talk. Incredibly, within a short time after the challenges sent by Gross, the poltergeist speaks, and this is the audio. Oh. It is a real raspy, guttural voice, something more like an old man. The voice. On this tape is recorded the voice of an 11-year-old girl. Well, perhaps you've got something to say, sir. Yes. I'd like to know how you make this noise without bashing Yannick's vocal cords to pieces. If I stop for half a minute, I get a sore throat. Who's chasing you? But he is very clear though, and he says his name is Bill Wilkins, and he says that is his home. His words are clear. He says he first went blind, then he had a hemorrhage. And finally, that he died in a chair in the corner downstairs. At the intervention right now is Terry Wilkins, who says I lived inside the Oxon house, and Bill was my father, and this is the cemetery where Bill is buried.
The Enfield Cemetery is huge, it's vast, so actually finding Bill's Toba is going to be a challenge, but I don't do dead want to find it. The whole thing however revolves around the fact that actually Bill existed, actually Bill lived inside the Oxen House, so what the girls said, what they felt inside maybe was not just a figment of their imagination. Sorry. Don't you ever get a sore throat, Yannick? So, you never get pain in the back of the neck or something? I'm not with you. But what? No, you're with me now? With me? Um, I don't have a feeling that they can meet him. Well, tell us about that. I don't know, it's no, a tell cockpit. Me about, tell me about that, you get it, you get it now? Do you feel it vibrating as if it was sort of... Um... We've got someone. A cockpit. Someone, Come on, what? A cockpit. Yes. The most amazing thing is that Terry also confirms everything the girls had said regarding Mr. Bill's death. Yes, he had gone blind. Yes, he had died in a chair on the lower floor of the house. But one question remains. How did they know? Who had told them? They couldn't have any idea. They couldn't even have any idea that Bill really existed. And so one wonders, was Bill really speaking through their voice? There is a doubt though, many scientists begin to suspect that those little girls are actually pretending or somehow exaggerating, and they especially begin to suspect that they knew something about Bill, or at least that he had lived inside their house. Wait, where did the voices stop? Found her? Yes, he found it. Oh my god, Raga! I swear to shudder it just happened like that. Did he really find her or not? But she's sick. Where is she? I don't know. I don't know. Eh, uh, it beats my neck in an exaggerated way. That's good. I don't know. Bravo. Treasure of memories of... A dear husband and father, William Perkins, who died June 20, 1963. He is 61 years old. Exactly us. Yes, you guys. That's right. That's him. That's him. That's exactly him. And I ended up there by accident because I got... It's no accident. The incredible discovery of Bill's grave generates a real wandering in Enfield, and more specifically here in this cemetery, as far as the paranormal world is concerned. Every figure of reference, as far as the paranormal world is concerned, is here in Enfield, among them also Ed and Lorraine Warren, two figures whom I have always described to you in a great many of my videos, and whom I have told you more about in various areas as well, especially last year, when I went to one of their first cases, including the cemetery where Ed is buried. Ed and Lorraine begin to investigate, and are convinced that the Oxon House is indeed the victim of demonic possession. They agree that Margaret has somehow levitated above the floor. She then disappeared into thin air and reappeared inside a fuse box. Margaret's position is so complicated that I cannot reproduce it, and I see were therefore that paranormal and totally unexplained phenomenon. Other visitors, however, are not so convinced that what goes on inside the Oxon House is so truthful. Among them in particular is SPR scholar Anita Gregory, who describes the evidence recounted at the house as questionable and not very credible. The evidence? A video filmed in great secrecy where Janet is seen bending spoons, spoons that she later recounts seeing bending independently. Many years later, Janet, who now has a family and three children, will claim that yes, parts of that whole story were, in some way, tampered with. I keep... I know one...
Mr. Gross, many people who hear these voices produced by children will simply say that they are very good ventriloquists and that it is a hoax. How would you react? Certainly not. They are certainly not very good ventriloquists. We did test to see if they can do ventriloquists. I can't. Maintaining this particular type of voice for a period of time without damaging the vocal cords is absolutely impossible. In short, there has to be some hoarseness. But don't forget that these children don't do it for a couple of minutes or so. They do it for long periods of up to three hours. Little Janet is locked up inside a psychiatric hospital. From this time on, the paranormal phenomena inside Grace Tripp's house diminish considerably, and then a theory begins to develop. She was possibly the poltergeist. In September, Janet then returns to the house, and here things violently return to being very similar to the previous months. But at that point, we actually have the final intervention of a medium, Mangling, who in October 78 succeeds in ridding the house of the poltergeist, effectively giving a hypothetical end to this whole thing. Unfortunately, however, the terrible events within the Hoxton family do not end there. A few months later, Janet's younger brother dies of cancer. Peggy and her last son-in-law, Billy, remain inside the house for almost two decades. In 2003, Peggy dies of breast cancer. After Peggy's death in 2003 inside the Hoxton house, another family, the Bennett family, consisting of Claire and her four children, moves in. A few days after their move, something strange begins to happen, and during the night, strange voices are heard coming from downstairs. One of her children, 15-year-old Chaka, wakes up in the middle of the night and screams, Mom, there's a man in my room. The Bennett family at that point decides to abandon the dwelling and never return. Today at Duo 84 Green Street, there is a family that wants absolutely no part of it. They have installed security systems and keep saying that their children are afraid. Things are very different here around Enfield, however, and many people still talk about strange noises coming from that house. More than 30 years have passed between all the paranormal phenomena in the Enfield house, and there is still no point to this story. To this day, the Enfield case divides public opinion. There are those who blindly believe this story and those who find it absolutely a fabricated case based on nothing. I leave the opinion to you. What do you think? The more I would like to someday actually spend time more. inside that house and see what is there. Today it's in a part. Attempted. Crazy, crazy, but now who is to pull? You. Ah, it's my turn? It's your turn. Come on, the black comes out. Mom, what a dream. The black. Ladies! Oh God, I don't want to be a fan ever again, but Hannibal Lecter? Heh. I hadn't read it, but you on the other hand, you hook up with a cannibal? Oh God. Look, then I have a lot of characters who want to tell their stories. One of them is a cannibal, or at least says he is. Be careful, Mamma Mia. No, let's go meet him. No, but you say you come from a full stomach. Paolo. No, got it. Let's see what happens. But wow, the story is told, and if he has eaten someone, we will only find out if he has eaten him. If he will tell us. I get sick. <laughs> 